And you'd be surprised, there's even an article that came out a little while ago in The Economist that said, out of all the countries that develop public-private partnerships trying to mimic or copy what was they considered to be Silicon Valley's success, um, well over 80 to 90% of those have shut down. They've run out of money because it's just not a sustainable model. I had one, this gentleman right over here when I was at one of the incubators in India, he said, yeah, he said, we're now starting to realize that Silicon Valley, it's a lot like a Lamborghini that gets three miles to the gallon. <laughs> it's a horrific use of capital input to innovation output. And we're, and we're looking for ways we can make more efficient and, and have a new metric of not how much money we've raised in funds, but how, how can we get the most for every dollar we put in, which I thought was a really good way of looking at it. And that's stuck with me, and this idea also too, that the very nature of entrepreneurship is being rethought, being redefined, which is not just anyone launching businesses, but anyone figuring out creative ways to build personal wealth outside of just a paycheck. I see you all here for Million Cups. If you're here for something else, you're in the wrong place. It's nine o'clock on Wednesday morning, so it's time to check in. Um, you can point your phone at that or at the piece of paper that's lying uh, on the table there, and you can check in to show you were at mil one million cups. If you do that on three occasions, you'll get a free pen. If you do that on six occasions, you'll get a free notebook. So, hey, you can't beat swag. Uh, check in and win your chance to win free prizes. All right. Uh, we are one million cups, Albuquerque, and this is our mission. Oh, wow, can you do that? Our mission is to lower the barrier of access to education, resources, and connection for new and aspiring entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurship is a difficult and sometimes lonely journey, and we are here to take away the loneliness and to help you identify your unknown unknowns, things you don't know and you don't know you don't know. There's a lot of talent in this room and in this community, and you're only one or two connections away from getting what you need as an entrepreneur. Okay, and how do we do that? We work toward that mission through um, assistance from the Kauffman Foundation, which, was, which has set up a program to train organizers to uh, create instances of one million cups, in one million cups chapters, as it were, all across the country. And every one of those communities has unique strengths and weaknesses, but they give us a consistent program for entrepreneurs, and they tell us how to train the presenters to give the one million cups presentation. So uh, we are the only folks in New Mexico, but there are a bunch of other chapters in the Southwest. Uh, I've been to some of these. If you're on the road and it's Wednesday morning at 9 a.m., try stopping in. You'll see a familiar program. If you can't get enough One Million Cups, you can get on Zoom at 7 in the morning and go in New York. Uh, have a cup of coffee, get here at 9, and you'll be good. You can do it twice in a day if you want. Okay, what are our key pillars? How do we make this whole thing work? These are presentations. They're not pitches. I'm not going to say that pitches are um, misleading exactly, but they highlight important things that that particular audience wants to hear, like how your co uh, company has all the talent it needs. It has an, an unassailable intellectual property moat, and it has bright prospects ahead of it, if only they would inject capital. Um, that's not really true of most companies at that stage, but that's the presentation that they make. If you're a struggling entrepreneur, what you really need to do is stand in front of a community that understands what you're going through and ask for help with the challenges that you currently have. And you'll get that help. So those are the presentations rather than the pitches. Those are authentic connections. So if somebody comes up to you and says, you know, a year ago, I was facing exactly what you're facing and here's what I did about it. That's what we want to have happen here. Not a speed dating thing where we all just pass out business cards. So it's run for the community, by the community. Uh, the organizers are not financially compensated, but we, I will speak for my own part, we receive rich rewards from our participation in this process, and it's actually helped uh, my business uh, personally. So uh, I certainly recommend participation. We're radically and intentionally inclusive. All kinds of people, all kinds of businesses. You could have a brick and mortar shop that's a mom and pop operation, you could have a whiteboard company that maybe just got a little bit of funding with a comma in it, or you could be a tentpole company that honors us by their presence and doesn't need all that much from us, but is here to teach us. things. Any one of those kind of companies is welcome and everything in between. So uh, don't be shy. 
about helping other people out or presenting. So that's a more of our mission statement. You're not alone in this community. Um, you should reach out. And as part of this community, try to be friendly and helpful and educational. And if there, somebody says something that you have a strong disagreement with, uh, you could either frame it in polite terms or uh, keep it to yourself. There are times when you should take advantage of the opportunity to remain silent. Okay, and however, applying to present is not one of those opportunities. Really, this is your opportunity to speak out, to reach out to the community. Very easy to apply to present. Just go to one of the organizers and say, can you help me through your terrible website? And, and we will. So uh, what we will do is coach you on how to give a presentation that's not the usual pitch, that exposes your challenges and vulnerabilities and ends with community ads. Um, this is our team. I'm Paul Sutter. Lisa Atkins is right here. Eric Rents Whitmore may be lurking online. Uh, Adam is online, I guess, today. Sonia's online and Keiko and Oscar, I guess they're documenting people's families right now and uh, they're not here right now. But so it's the two of us, but we can prop you up folks. Uh, we'd like to thank our sponsors, Fat Pipe, for eight years, this has been our home. Uh, Jason Call Photography, always making us look good. Uh, great headshots too, by the way. And if you're trying to sell a ranch, you know, that aerial drone footage is just in. Okay, more than organized. Oh, hey. Organizing um, your stuff, your mind, and providing us with creamer. Foundation for Sustainable Living, providing coffee. Noventum Custom Software, great software and donuts. Uh, and Vive Solutions when they're here. Today's not one of those days. Tea and fruit for those trying to get off the sugar and caffeine thing. Why do cows wear bells? Because their horns don't work. How am I supposed to follow that? <laughs> With a clicker. <laughs> Just play it straight, man. Everyone will appreciate that. Gotcha. No more dad jokes. I think we get to introduce Alex. Alex Lavage with Startup Champs. He's a member here at Fat Pipe ABQ. Um, in coaching Alex, I discovered that he's here to help you guys, not us to help him. So I asked him to be a little bit vulnerable and do a little bit of both because he wants to be involved in the community and help all the startups, which is awesome. But we all know that One Million Cups is about getting up here, telling your story and being a little more, right? So he's gonna do a little bit of both today. Thank you, Lisa. Um, how's everyone doing this morning? Yeah, my gosh, what an amazing crowd, of beautiful people. I've been coming to this since I moved here about a year and a half ago. I think it's one of the largest crowds I've seen. So thank you all for being here. Um, and of course, again, you know, thank you, Lisa, for the heart that you put into Fat Pipe and this event. And um, of course, the Kaufman Foundation. I know a bunch of people that work over there. They've been doing great work for years to support entrepreneurship across the country. So with that, Startup Champs, how did I get here? Wanted to share that personal story. Um, what is Startup Champs? In a nutshell, it's a pre-launch growth consultancy. And I'll get into what that means later in the presentation. But to start, um, Hi, my name is Alex. Been proudly multitasking and, I'm, and undiagnosed, probably with ADHD since <laughs> 1979. Uh, <laughs> as a lot of uh, entrepreneurs, I'm sure, can relate. And uh, look at that kid. I think I was less than two years old. It's cute when you're little, right? It's not so cute when you're a teenager and you don't do your homework and mom and you know your parents look at your report card. It stops being cute. Uh, so I struggled with that when I was in high school. I went to a private high school that my grandparents paid for and was very academically rigorous. I think I got C's, which was like wearing a scarlet letter on your forehead. Um, but nevertheless, I went by the beat of my own drum. And I was fortunate to have two strong male role models in my life that I looked up to very much. One of whom, my father, I never met until I was actually 20. So he wasn't as much of an influence in my life until later, but I did read a lot of his books and I knew his story of basically working closely with Ralph Nader on a variety of different public interest campaigns in addition to there in the corner, be on the cover of Rolling Stone back in the seventies during his heyday when he was an FCC commissioner, very much advocating for the public interest, speaking out against media conglomeration, um, which back then was an issue and is even more so today. Um, 
my grandfather there to the left started one of the top ad agencies uh, in the Southeast called Lavagen Associates. He was a serial entrepreneurial writer, filmmaker, real estate investor, did a lot of stuff. And so I, I've always found in my life trying to find that balance between what I would call conscious activism. I was the type of kid that wanted to start recycling programs in my hometown of Knoxville, Tennessee, volunteer at homeless shelters, always trying to figure out like, how can we make everybody's lives just a little bit better? But then also figure out how can we launch a business model so that we can pay for it? Because otherwise you're going to get burned out. So with that, my collegiate um, experience, uh, after I left high school early at 16, I actually took the GED and then I uh, started some entrepreneurial ventures of my own and then started Oregon State University where I was close to graduation. And then in my fourth year, ran into some financial difficulties because I tried to launch a magazine where I thought I was going to be receiving a grant, it fell through, so I went into credit card debt to keep pushing that forward. Um, Needless to say, my mother and I are in wonderful terms now, but at the time I was disowned. She yeah. said, kid, you are on your own. I don't have tolerance for this at all whatsoever. So I felt so ashamed and so downtrodden, transferred to University of Iowa, where my father, who I met, was a uh, visiting law professor at the law school at the time and just thought, you know, hey, I, I need to be around family support, be around that side of the family. Challenge was, was that uh, now all those credits transferred. So First year ended up just being an academic disaster. I was uh, way, way too stressed. My GPA fell from a 3.7, so you don't want to know how low it got. Um, ended up getting that semester a raise. Next year, I worked at a plastics factory. The following two years, I said, I never want to financially struggle again. I want to learn about business and entrepreneurship. Well, that was great, but the only problem was that um, now my credit's transferred over. So at the end of eight years, has anyone seen that film called Van Wilder? Yeah, I, I think I have him beat. <laughs> like I was definitely the non-traditional student um, going on what felt like close to eight years. And even then I had over 160 credit hours, 120 required to graduate. Even then um, I wasn't able to get the degrees I wanted from the business college because my GPA pre-core requirement was like less than 0 0.04 off or something like that. I said, we're sorry, we can't make exceptions. So I got burnt out and I felt like I had something to prove at that. I was like, this is really frustrating. Like I've spent all this time, all this money, I've put myself, which I took personal responsibility for all this hardship. What I learned during this time was in order to help pay for school as I finish up um, eventually, or eventually finished up much later in life, University of Iowa online. At the time I did not, um, even though I was close, was I did property management for a couple of clients. I uh, managed about 42 rental properties in Iowa City and learned a lot about that market. and. And as I was in the entrepreneurship program, they're like, hey, if you could create a multi-million dollar business, what would it be? And I looked at that theme and I was like, well, yeah, what could I do? And I recognized there's a massive social inequity between roughly at the time, this would have been 2005, 35 million households paying rent, representing a $250 billion wealth transfer to the landlord class or real estate investment trusts, what have you, and having nothing to show for it, just money in, money out. So in my head, I was talking with a lot of different people across specifically Silicon Valley, the eBay ecosystem in particular, which owns PayPal and Rent.com and other subsidiaries, and asked them, is there a way we could build a platform where we could allow tenants to pay their rent online and improve their credit score at the same time? So that's what took me out to the Bay to learn very quickly that California is great um, to go out there with a dream, but if you're not prepared very quickly, you'll lose all your money in the dream. Uh, um, so that being said, it was still a positive experience. I caught the bug and I realized Silicon Valley is not just a place, it's a mindset. So as I uh, probably drank way, way too many energy drinks during that time in my life, I remember just waking up one day, just feeling totally exhausted. Um, I was burning both ends of the candle, trying to make a lot of consulting gigs work at the time. Um, I remember supporting a girlfriend at the time, go through graduate school. And also, most importantly, and this is, you know, back then, this was before I would say, for lack of a better word, the vulnerability movement took place. You know, you're feeling like you have to keep up appearances and not feeling like I could admit this vulnerability that I really was struggling, you know, during this time. So I ended up going back to my hometown, as most people do um, when they go through a period of trauma in their life, as I've come to understand. And I wanted to keep that magic going. I didn't want to throw in the towel. I wanted to keep going. So I launched the region's first uh, Entrepreneurial Community Center and co-working workspace. This would have been back in 2008, much like the fat pipe here. 
Um, our first year, we had less than a budget of about $14,000 and did over 144 different classes, events, seminars, and workshops. Um, that includes, but wasn't limited to, something called 48 Hour Launch, which is similar to Startup Weekend, if you all have heard of that. Um, I know Andrew Hyde, who started that fairly well, um, and his, his background in history. And then likewise, uh, launched the first TEDx Knoxville in the community, and a variety of other events with the idea that, you know, I was also involved with one of the mayoral campaigns at the time, Madeline Rojero, who we're very proud to call her first female mayor in uh, Knoxville, Tennessee, and promoting this idea that for entrepreneurship to thrive, the whole city needs to feel like a giant classroom, where there's ongoing classes and seminars and workshops, where you're helping people not just reach their business goals, but live their best lives. Um, so the only problem with that is despite there being a lot of superficial success, Fast Company Magazine called me the top social innovator for Tennessee back in like 2011 or something like that. I was a 40 under 40 in the business journal, getting lots of media attention and press is I couldn't pay bills. I was barely scraping by just doing websites, trying to make ends meet while also doing this at the same time. While my mother, of course, and I were back on talking terms and called me up every week wondering if I had a job with health insurance. <laughs> Thank you. I said, no, not yet. <laughs> Working on it. But back in, back in Chattanooga, um, it was interesting. There was a, Chattanooga has now become, which is south of Knoxville, by the way, about an hour, had gotten to be known for being a logistics hub. And particularly, there was a massive acquisition with a company called uh, Access America Transport um, for close to just under a billion dollars and a very small group of founders. So this massive influx of cash comes into the community and they've got the startup bug. And they've got that Silicon Valley hustle in them. And they're like, we want to fund all these companies. We're ready to support. So just with that type of money coming into a community, Chattanooga, about a population of 180,000. I was like, wow, so you guys would actually pay me to do what I was doing in Knoxville and um, uh, and you're investing in technology companies that are trying to compete on a global scale. That's amazing. Like, let's, let's go try that and see how that works out. Still wasn't easy. Uh, my first, my first uh, paid job, um, and I helped raise capital for this company as well called Variable. You can't see the logo up there, but we were among other things, uh, by CNN Money, called the coolest gizmo at 2013 CES, we, we pioneered making wireless sensor technology for smartphones. Um, that was used for both industrial applications and personal applications. And then that later evolved into become a portable colorimeter and spectrophotometer company, um, which is now our biggest partnership. It was with Sherman Williams, which now sells our device worldwide for, for color referencing, but then sends that to your phone so you're getting the red paint color. Um, after, after that and getting them to the first million dollars in sales as doing business development, um, which only, by the way, paid $40,000 a year. I mean, it was not, I, and I was putting at least 90 hours a week, if not more, hundred hours a week. It was not easy. I also put on a lot of weight during the time. Um, as you can see in the gig tape picture up there, um, where I joined a nonprofit called CoLab, which was supported by a lot of foundation money that was in the community as well as you know, some of these people that had sold their company and other sponsors. Um, and during that, I uh, led a national accelerator which attracted companies from around the world and did a lot of work with entrepreneurs where fundamentally I, I learned the difference between advising and coaching. Uh, raise your hand, do you, does that ring a bell? Does it make, make sense? Because when, when someone advises you, it's usually like I'm up here and you're down there. I'm gonna tell you what to do to be successful, trust me. I think that's a very unhealthy dynamic. I think coaching is a much better dynamic where I'm level-headed looking you in the eye, meeting you where you're at. And I'm saying flat out, I don't know what's right for you. The best I can do is help ask you, help you ask the right questions. So you can determine for yourself what's an assumption and what's a fact. So that's what I did here. But this was really a kicker because not only during Gig Tank, when I was on stage, a story there that happened literally the day before I learned that my uncle committed suicide because he had, with what money he had inherited to launch a kid's furniture company, he ran out of money and he felt so ashamed by it that he didn't know what else to do. Um, he was not guided through a process to make a financially sustainable company. And that was devastating to me. As devastating as the entrepreneurs that I worked with, the greater majority of whom 
I felt like we're a part of a nonprofit organization that was really focused on optics more than success. The people that were supporting this entrepreneurial support system were often in real estate. And they said, hey, we want to create a brand for this city to make it seem like this is the hip place where people are bringing capital and ideas and tech and all of these things. And that increases real estate value. So that was their vested interest. But the externality was I saw people go through depression, bankruptcy, divorce, a lot of unsustainable pathways were being pitched to them as, hey, this is the way to reach the American dream. But there was a problem. It just wasn't true for the majority of people. The only people that sought to benefit were the investor class who either were going to win a little or going to win a lot. But for, for those that got into that circuit, it was all or nothing. And if it was nothing, you're on your own. And that bothered me. So that kind of led me to start up Startup Champs um, after working with a lot of different startup companies. And has anyone seen the show HBO Silicon Valley? Yeah. Okay. So if you haven't seen it, watch it. Everything in there is everything I can share with Laura. It's, I wish I had worked with my judge on that. It's a fantastic show talking about the, the traditional pitfalls of going with the sort of this what's in my view has become sort of this old school model. Like, hey, if you have an idea, go through an accelerator, do a, do a pitch deck, do a demo day, there's seed stage capital, right? And it's just, everything is just wonderful. It just doesn't really work out that way. And when you look at a lot of meta-analyses, here we are 20 years later, 25 years later, since the Silicon Valley day, CBA, CB Insights did a great study where they said, you know, what were some of the 20, Top reasons why a startups fail, of which the top three were, well, there's not a product market fit. There's no market need. Um, these companies ran out of cash. And they didn't have the right team, which also includes the founder not taking time for self-awareness to figure out where are they adding the most value to the company? Where do they need to step down and let other people step up and do their job? So that kind of led to um, this methodology behind Startup Champs, which I won't get into great detail because, again, this isn't a pitch, but these are just three really important principles that for anyone thinking about entrepreneurship can keep you out of a lot of predictable pitfalls and trouble. And the first is phase one. Are you ready? And what that means is just being very self-aware with where you're at right now in life. How well do you know the industry you want to get into? Um, what's your connectivity in that industry? Also, a very important one that I later learned is what's your access to capital or your own personal capitalization? I ended up finding my target persona were people over the age of 45, mostly high net worth individuals, in some case, large companies, Fortune 1000s. But these were people that had the bandwidth where even if their new venture failed, they could still pay the bills and keep the lights on. So that, that for me as a consultant was really important because otherwise I couldn't make business as a for-profit entity um, trying to work with people who wanted stuff for free or for cheap. So the second is, is the market ready? That's not just a combination of doing primary and secondary market research, where there's a lot of data science and analytics, where you're looking at basically why people buy what they buy, but then also looking at specifically how to get your, your potential market in the room through a collaborative design process to help you design that product or service. So design thinking is a very popular methodology for that, but there are a lot of them that are out there. But having that is often skipped. One of my favorite uh, role models that you saw in a picture earlier, Steve Blank, has a great um, saying, a vision is not a fact. And entrepreneurs get stuck in their own head. They're like, well, this is, this is going to be amazing for the world. It's like, if you don't have real people feeling like they're involved in the process, it's probably going to fall back flat on its face. And you're making it a lot harder than it has to be. And then the last one is, can predictable growth and that is writing the scripts, both from a tech perspective and a sales perspective, whether you're looking to build a board of advisors, which is often an overlooked component in tech startups for building trust, both with the public and with investors, but then also, um, you know, for getting ultimately pre-orders or deposits. So if, if you know, like, for instance, I had one client who was making uh, manufactured commercial grade scuba equipment, he needed... Um, we were able to get $14 million in pre-orders, one of my flagship case studies, of which once that was validated, was able to get a million dollars in what's known as AR financing that was backed through both state programs as well as two um, advisors that in exchange for equity in the company guaranteed the remainder of that. And that allowed him to then get going with the production process for, for this without giving up equity. 
which I thought was, you know, I mean, again, that's the idea is to give the entrepreneurs as much control as possible and to only bring in outside investment capital uh, if you feel like you have to, not just because you need the money, but because they're providing strategic value that can allow you to scale up your business and level up. So, and it's really important that we continue to get this message across. I've spoken to colleges and universities across the country, also across the world. A lot of, a lot of programs are still in this pre-2007 schema that, oh, if you have an idea, there's a seed stage capital out there and you just need to pitch and someone's going to write you a big check and you're off to the races. I, I hate to say it, we're just not doing that anymore. We haven't for a while. So I've been very much more focused in the 2014 and present because even this, even seed stage capital, it's very unlikely that you're going to get any of that unless you have a track record of exits or working with other successful startups uh, on your resume. So the best way to work around that is just get pre-orders and deposits and to validate, you know, with real money that there's a real market demand out there. Um, and we were learning this lesson, not just in East Tennessee, but in 2019, before COVID hit, um, I put together a budget for myself with some money I'd made from consulting and traveled six continents. I spoke in a lot of different places, did podcasts, and more importantly, just asked a lot of questions to different entrepreneurial communities around the world and asked them, um, what's working? What isn't? And you'd be surprised, there's even an article that came out a little while ago in The Economist that said, out of all the countries that develop public-private partnerships trying to mimic or copy what was they considered to be Silicon Valley success, um, well over 80 to 90% of those have shut down. They've run out of money because it's just not a sustainable model. I had one, this gentleman right over here when I was at one of the incubators in India, he said, yeah, he said, we're now starting to realize that Silicon Valley, it's a lot like a Lamborghini that gets three miles to the gallon. <laughs> it's a horrific use of capital input to innovation output. And we're, and we're looking for ways we can make more efficient and, and have a new metric of not how much money we've raised in funds, but how, how can we get the most for every dollar we put in, which I thought was a really good way of looking at it. And that's stuck with me, and this idea also, too, that the very nature of entrepreneurship is being rethought, being redefined, which is something I hope um, my friends at Kauffman Foundation really take to heart, because I think there's still a disconnect there between academia and research, but also what everyday people like ourselves that are not in the 1%, we're in the 99%, um, are starting to see that entrepreneurship is about not just anyone launching businesses, but anyone figuring out creative ways to build personal wealth outside of just a paycheck. So when I got back to Chattanooga after this world trip, I put together $25,000 and launched this grassroots movement called Reboot Chattanooga, where it was a counter to, we had a lot of leaders in the community from the top down saying, all we need is that next billion dollar exit, that next billion dollar startup. How can we do that? How can we get that home run win? And as I surveyed entrepreneurs, they're like, yeah, that sounds good in theory, but, um, but there are a lot of externalities and problems that come with that. One of them is it's only really the founders that get rich. Yes, you're creating jobs, but a lot of those jobs you're creating, people aren't increasing their savings rate. And I mean, they're not getting rich per se, unless they're a part of the C-suite and they get maybe some equity. But then also the larger issue is that as you scale up, unless that money is in the community, you've got to get outside investors. And so assuming there is an exit, where does that money go? It goes back to wherever those investment firms are, whether it's California, New York, I see some heads nodding. So you've probably seen this theme before. So then we have to get back to why. What's, you know, why are we doing this? You know, especially in places like, let's look at New Mexico. Like we want to build community well here, right? Um, rather than, you know, send more money to California or some of these financial centers. So that was, so that was the idea. It was like, well, what if we didn't try to make a billion dollar company, but instead we're focused as a community on making a billion dollar impact. By, by trying to put together programs to help create a thousand uh, self-made millionaires in as little as 10 years. And through this survey, we surveyed hundreds of entrepreneurs in the community to realize there are a lot of pathways towards building personal wealth. And, and, and a lot of people willing to share their stories as well about how they did it. And, and, and my hope and my question is fundamentally, is that, is that something that we can do here in Albuquerque? Um, how can we grow personal, benevolent wealth in Albuquerque? That's one of my challenges I hope we can talk about um, today. The other thing I just wanted to say is I'm 
very hesitant. Like I said, I'm still that little kid trying to carry three things. Still not officially diagnosed with ADHD, but I'm pretty sure I've got elements of it. So I don't like to talk about anything before it's done. So I'm being vulnerable by putting this out there, but I am working on a book called Smarter Decisions Faster, um, which I'll be putting up on smarterdecisionsfaster.com soon. And this is basically, I've worked with a lot of technology companies, which I'm happy to talk about if there's interest, that have utilized AI as a part of their platform. And for me, one of the most interesting things I see as um, even some of my really good friends here in the audience, you know, we will sit around and talk about like, well, where are the opportunities for tech? What, what could I be working on? And that's really what I want to focus on in this book is to say, you know, given, given that same spirit of sort of uh, uh, civic responsibility and conscious activism with, entre with sustainable entrepreneurship, how can we start to have more conversations, less about this is what the technology can do and can't do, and more specifically, what are the exact possible use cases that can benefit both people and uh, the planet, um, and there'd be a strong business case for it as well that aren't normally talked about in, in the public sphere, so that everyday entrepreneurs can take advantage of those opportunities as long as, first and foremost, they're building their own personal wealth, and they're going about getting pre-orders and deposits in a methodical way, because if you do that, uh, it's a really exciting time to be an entrepreneur. So with that, um, I'm easy to find online. As far as I know, there's only one Alex Lavage on the web. Uh, you won't find anything bad about me. I can't promise you'll find anything good either. Um, but that's how to find me. Reach out anytime and happy to open up for questions. I have questions in person here and then online as well. I'm going to stop sharing the slides for the audience. All right, we'll start with Zach and then Sandra, I'll come to you for whoever's first. I'll figure that out while Zach's talking. Hey, I'm Zach. Whoa, that's weird to hear behind you. Do you hear that the whole time? Okay. <laughs> I'm Zach, a software engineer here locally. Um, my question for you for the smaller companies that are doing kind of that later stage fundraising, like you're talking about, not later stages in terms of Series C, but that 2014 to present, that bootstrapped, getting as far as you can with a seed round. What are some, um, some of the common things that you see, like common pitfalls for those companies nowadays? Because I think Back in the day, it was just burning capital, not finding product market fit, and then running out of money. But nowadays, if you are bootstrapped, what would you say some of the most common pitfalls are? Uh, great question. Um, I would say it comes down to three things. One is raise your hand if you've heard the term uh, growth hacking. Yeah, a few of you. It's a very divisive term. Some people love it. Some people hate it. I get it. But the idea is to basically combine understanding um, sales and marketing, specifically consumer psychology from an engineering perspective, what are ways to go out and find your customers and to get scripts in front of them so that you've got, again, predictable revenue, predictable growth. And so one of the things that happens often is when you've got a new technology company or a new platform, um, it's a little bit like, you know, the first three months of dating, right? I mean, you're like, oh my gosh, this person's amazing. It's exciting. It's great. And then you're just like, oh, well, we need to figure out how we're going to helping each other. Otherwise, the, the initial newness sort of wears off. And I see that with a lot of tech companies. You know, they're like, oh, everything's great because everyone's supporting us. We've got all these early adopters, but then they're not looking at churn rate or daily active users, and, you know, all of those really important metrics for if it's going to be long-term and sustainable. So I would say that. And then second is just realizing, especially now, um, people are so tired of being pitched. They're so tired of being sold. They're so tired. I mean, how many messages do we get each day? I think it's like four or 5,000 through social media, radio, billboards, you know, our brains are frazzled. And so the more you can build communities and platforms to develop authentic connections with people and let them know that, you know, hey, this is something like we're real people and we know you're real people and we, we care about helping you solve your problem or adding value to your life or making your life more fun. Um, that, I hate to use this term, but that creates a stickiness factor that then helps people then not only support your brand, but feel like it's even a part of their identity and they're gonna go out and tell their friends and family about it. Yeah. Uh, Miriam, I can't tell if you have a question, but if so, you're first. No question or comment. Okay, Sandra. Hey, uh, Sandy Hirschberg here. I created an organization called the New Mexico Startup Alliance within the last year. And um, we probably have a million things to talk about you and I. Uh, cool. But I would love to talk about one particular challenge that I see in my community. Um, 
is people like you who have these amazing skills and amazing experience. And I have several of them that I've been trying to crack the nut of how do we afford them or make a subsidized situation for access to quality coaching support, people who can roll up their sleeves and actually do the work for startups, even at later stages, because they have the need just as much as everybody else's, but the, the culture and the atmosphere in New Mexico is like you had alluded to earlier, that they, they're they not willing to pay for things on a level that Silicon Valley would or can, it's just not in our culture. Um, no. and, and we're also proof in the pudding, like you can prove yourself and then they'll pay, but it's a complicated chicken or the egg and anyone worth their time is actually gonna need to be paid or you're gonna get sub quality work sometimes. And it's a very complicated conundrum that I'm wrapping my head around with the community right now. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, let's uh, let's definitely talk. I'll try to keep it short. Um, I'll, I'll say this right now. My my full time job is actually I work with a gentleman here at Fat Pipe, Mark Kelly, for a solar company called Photon Rainbow. Um, if everyone's interested in solar, talk to me. I, I did uh, research for um, at least three dozen different solar uh, installers, and I went with these guys because they're really good at what they do. Um, but that, that that's allowing me to build my own personal wealth. In addition to investing, living simply, you know, to save all my friends, save investments, repeat, so that I can get back to feeling like um, I can help those companies on a personal level without expecting financial compensation. Um, but, but until then, that's my focus. And I think that's ultimately the larger answer is because at the end of the day, the theme that I discovered when I did that global trip was when you, when you get into this mentality of centralization, meaning there's centralized power that's providing help you know, they're up here, everyone else is down here and they're providing the resources and the support and the coaching and everything. And these people aren't paying for it. Um, psychologically, that's disempowering. Um, it's a lot better to, again, sort of jump on this global bandwagon that we're seeing and redefine entrepreneurship. So it's not just people launching companies, but anyone building personal wealth outside just a paycheck. And there are a lot of creative ways to do that. And when you go down that path, you have money to then spend and experiment. And if you lose, it's not the end of the world. But the other thing I like about that, and I'll just say this real fast, is when I was doing Startup Champs, I was competing with my old employer, being a nonprofit, who had you know over a seven-figure budget. And so it kind of messed up free market principles, because why would entrepreneurs want to come and pay me a minimum of $120 an hour to work with them when they could go into a nonprofit supported by foundations for free? So we really have to think about from a stakeholder management perspective, how all those players can work well together so that we realize we're all on the same team. You know, it's cooperation. there's no competition because I think all of our hearts are in the right place. Now we just have to make sure that everyone's goals are aligned. Marty, we'll go you and then we'll come back to you, Eric. Okay. Good. Thank you for this talk, by the way. It's Thank you. been my experience over the last 30 years of entrepreneurship and uh, started out in Brooklyn, New York, and, and so competed in you know the you know the pitch it the um, business plan competitions, you know, all of that kind of stuff. Um, but uh, I guess my my thing is there's a lot of we've been talking a lot about tech and um, what I am curious about is any of this assistance or help in, in terms of, there's a lot of money in tech. It, I've become very aware of age tech now. <laughs> Recently, I was just like, what is that? <laughs> and it's like, I've got friends that got tons of money that um, do that. But I've always been a service-based um, business. I, I am slowly learning how to scale it, but it's always been a service-based business. And I'm wondering, what kind of um, Who's Annie? Can respond to that about sure. service based, and then I wanted with the personal wealth stuff to find out if you know about the fire movement, which yep. I imagine. Yep. Yep. <laughs> yeah, I think the uh, fire movement is great, and is especially now in the world of the web, there really are a lot of great online personal coaches and resources. But I think um, you know, as I think it's the old John Maxwell quote: "People don't." Care about how much you know until they know how much you care. 
So really, really one of the most important things, especially for you know, some underserved areas of our community that we step up and take the time out and change the community one relationship at a time and to let them know, hey, no matter who you are, where you're starting from, um, you can build yourself back up. So with, with that, uh, to, to answer your question, I've worked with small businesses as well. Um, I mean, I've, there have been um, some uh, clients over the years. One opened a coffee shop, and, um, but it's same same principles, where it was go out and sell gift cards uh, at a discount and then provide a lot of perks. They were able to launch their coffee shop with over $120,000 in the bank before even opening the door. So, and, and when you look at, you know, construction companies, like into restaurants have the highest failure rates for small businesses. Um, that significantly mitigates a lot of the risk, that way of thinking. Um, and so that you're coming out of the gate in the black. So we can talk more later, but I would just say in general, any small business or any non-tech company, yeah, even if you're not out there trying to raise investment capital, still just putting, you know, Raise your hand if you've ever done steps four, six, and five before steps one, two, and three first. Yeah, I mean, that's, again, that's been the story of my life. So I, I think that success is not just getting things done, it's getting the right things done and in the right order. We often are our own worst enemy and we get in our own way of making things fun and profitable because we're doing things in an incorrect order. Eric, I think you're next. Hello, hello. Yeah, this is a great presentation. Really appreciated it. Uh, learning more about your story and all that. Um, I think we talked like 10, 12 years ago. Uh, I was, I'm just curious, like, so the difference between um, like an ecosystem like Chattanooga, I think you may have joined there kind of when it was on the, I don't know, percolating, maybe on the upswing. I'm curious what you see and when you compare comparison as a thief of joy, when you look at Albuquerque, what do you see you know, sort of a unfettered look at some of the weaknesses, but also the strengths that you think uh, give us a good opportunity here? Yeah, absolutely. Great question. Um, well, for, for starters, I mean, you've had some big names pass through Albuquerque over the past few years. I mean, from Jeff Bezos to uh, Paul Allen and Bill Gates to um, what's the guy's name who was with Tom Shoes, Blake Mikowski, I believe, you know, I mean, there have been a lot of big names that, that have come through here. So it's, in the cultural DNA already. Um, and that's really cool, you know, plus, you know, all of us in this room as well. I think the other thing I see that's really interesting too is New Mexico has got, uh, I believe the highest concentration of PhDs per capita than any other state in the country. So we've got an overflowing amount of tech talent in the state that can really build amazing, cool stuff. The issue is they just need direction. Um, tech transfer is, in my opinion, uh, a dismal failure 95% of the time. And in most research institutions, it's just more optics. They want to show us taxpayers that they're doing good stuff with our hard earned taxpayer dollars, but there's not anything that leads to real commercialization. Um, so that being said, there are opportunities and Coffin's actually done some research in this, which I'm happy to talk about later, but with some of the technology that's being developed here in our state, we could turn those into some pretty big companies if we wanted to. I think the other thing is uh, a part of my story is when I moved here a couple of years ago, initially it was a client that was doing a real estate project. I'll talk about that later. But after that ended, I got kind of burnt out from doing consulting, honestly. So I uh, drove for Uber actually for three months. And as I talked to people in this community, I mean, I picked up everyone from, you know, two really friendly drug lords on Central to, <laughs> to, you know, multimillionaires living up in Santa Fe and everywhere in between. Um, this, this community has got a ton of hustle and a ton of people that are willing to pay it for it. It starts there. And, and I think, and I think what, what this community needs right now, I see is it's a little bit 10 years behind where Chattanooga was in terms of thought leadership. I say that from a place of love, not criticism. Is, and, I, and I think it's a great opportunity for us because it means that rather than, you know, allowing institutions and government agencies and whatever to be like, well, where are the best practices? What can we duplicate? Now is really a time for the artists and the poets and the intuitives and the creatives to step up and to say, no, actually, we have a unique, authentic soul. We don't need to imitate anyone. We need to be who we are and build on our strengths. And as we do that, plus, you know, embracing this new definition of entrepreneurship, 
where we're supporting each other to build personal wealth first and then explore building companies second. As I like to joke back in Chattanooga, then we might be able to have nice things. But <laughs> until then, uh, a lot of this stuff has been proven to be unsustainable the way it's been done for the past couple of decades. Awesome, thank you. Cliff, I believe yeah, you're sure. next. Are you in line, Cliff, to ask a question? Yeah. Yep, come on up. Thank you. Um, I'm Cliff, I actually uh, with Alan House. Uh, so uh, you have talked about some of my questions are concerning uh, already. Uh, you talked about 80 or 90 percent of those uh, communities try to mimic Silicon Valley actually failed. So um, my original thought was what other corporations for them to fail and, uh, and how to actually uh, correct that or prepare this community uh, to be a successful. Uh, in that direction. Fantastic question. Um, thinking on the fly, let me address it this way. Raise your hand if you saw that film at Jurassic Park back in the day. Can anyone explain to me why they had just one power generator on the island? Right? I mean, how stupid, <laughs> right? Because of course then like you've got the, the, the whole thing's a mess after that. Uh, in tech speak, you look at, well, what did we do with um, data centers back in the day? You had virtualization software. You've got redundancy. If, if, if something goes down, you've got multiple redundancies to back it up. Or likewise, we see that with blockchain and so on and so forth. So I think, I think the principle is, when, is just in a broad sense, the problem is centralization. When you've got the rich getting richer and you've got more centralized power, more centralized control, more centralized capital, and you've got this entrepreneurial class feels like they have to go through them to ask permission or to get free resources or to get free help right out of the gate that sets the wrong mindset and heart set for entrepreneurship in my opinion um silicon valley has always been an interesting case because they are so overcapitalized even to this day despite doing business in california becomes harder and harder um 50 of all vc funds go to silicon valley Roughly, last time I checked, it might have gone down a little bit since I think it's like 2018 data. But that, but that being said, it's when you're sort of in that privileged mindset of like, oh, there's always more money, then you just, again, it's like that quote I heard from India. Oh, you all have Silicon Valley. It's like a Lamborghini that gets three miles to the gallon. It's very inefficient. It looks sexy. But in terms of that ratio of capital input, innovation output, um, where, you know, and then less than 1% of those companies end up going out to IPO, which is a part of the problem with the VC model is that you don't really get your money back until there's an exit or an IPO, right? So um, I was at an angel capital association conference in Boston a few years ago. They're talking about, you know, angel investing is trying to reinvent itself so that investors get dividends and these types of things, you know, along the way. But in short, the, the solution is when people are playing with their own wealth, they make decisions differently. It puts them in a different mindset and heart set. And then it also creates a different dynamic. So if you do need to raise capital in an ideal situation, you're not giving up equity to do it. I know we have more people online with questions. Um, and Alex, can you give your contact information again real quick? Yeah, sure. They want to know online, just give out an email. Yeah, just my email is, is just my name, Alex, A-L-E-X, Lavage, L-A-V-I-D-G-E, at iCloud.com. Um, I'm also a, a, a tenant here at, a, at Fat Pipe. I work with Mark and the crew at a Photon Rainbow. We're a residential and commercial solar installation company. It's really my full-time gig to pay the bills. But this, this is my passion. This is my side hustle. So um, my challenge is, you know, again, just anyone who can help me get introduced to people who are passionate about AI and their applications, very open to that. Also very open at any time. New Mexico is now my full-time home. Um, thank you all for taking me in because I just really love it here. Um, and uh, always willing to talk with anyone in that entrepreneurial ecosystem space to ask you know, that question, what can we be doing better? I think you answered our one question, what can we do for you? And the second question is red or green? Oh, uh, green. Is it green? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> awesome. Awesome job. Thank you.
So I'm gonna let Paul take us out. We are out of time. Uh, normally we like to do this to come back next week if you're an agent, so we can have you do um, Ooh, go ahead. Okay. Did the microphone? Did everyone pull it that? All right. Paul, take it out. All right. Well, folks, uh, I think we've had uh, one vision of what we can do to uh, lift Albuquerque uh, up in the eyes of the world and uh, to make us all uh, richer and happier. Uh, there are lots of other ways to do it, and uh, get out there and do something about it in the week to come. And we'll see you back here a week from now. Go out and lift up entrepreneurship in New Mexico. See you next week.